Hey, we are now live on the air. Hey, folks, thanks for tuning into the Banff Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Lafferty. And today we're talking about horror. Um, horror, kids, not the other. And it's going to be in, you know, gaming, RPGs, uh, media. And we have Mr. James Louder from Chaosium here with us. How are you doing, James? Hey there. Hey, James, you have a long and illustrious uh, resume. Uh, I could talk about it for about five minutes just looking at your Wikipedia page. Could you give the listeners just a, a quick summary of uh, who you are and what you're known for? Well, I, I've uh, been part of the hobby game publishing industry since the late 80s when I started working for TSR. I was an in-house editor for TSR for several years, uh, line editor uh, in the fiction uh, department, line editor for the Forgotten Realms and Ravenloft and Dark Sun and, and several of the other smaller lines. Uh, starting in about 92, I went freelance, and since that time, I've worked for most of the most of the publishers in the industry. Uh, as a writer, I've done novels for TSR. I did uh, Night of the Black Rose in the Ravenloft line, and uh, Prince of Lies and Ring of Winter uh, for Forgotten Realms. Ring of Winter is uh, being kind of mined right now for a lot of the Tomb of Annihilation stuff uh, that's going on with the big D and D launch this year. Uh, I've put together uh, anthologies, 20 to 25 anthologies, everything from All Flesh Must Be Eaten to uh, the City of Heroes novels. I was the line editor for those for a publishing house in New York. Uh, and uh, I work as a publishing consultant and was recently hired uh, by Chaosium to relaunch their fiction line. And uh, that's my that's my main gig right now. Though I'm still working on other stuff for Shadow of the Demon Lord and Pugmire and some other lines uh, in uh, fiction as well. I've also done role playing games, comics. I was the line. I was the uh, editor for Hackslash for a, a number of years. The Devils Do an Image Book, and uh, have written some comics myself. And uh, didn't you just win any this last time around? We did. We just won an any for Pulp Cthulhu uh, project. That was around for a very long time before it got finished. Uh, it actually started in 2003, I believe, <laughs> was when we started work on that project. Uh, and it was supposed to be 1930s Cthulhu, uh, where the characters were powered up enough that they stood a chance of surviving the game. That was sort of, you could win, it'd be a pyrrhic victory, but you had a chance of winning week to week and, and surviving. And the project went, uh, went through four or five different iterations. I was the original project coordinator for it. And uh, it was a D20 product at one point. It went through several versions of uh, Cthulhu Who Rules. And then when the new owners took over, uh, Mike Mason got a hold of the, the, the line and said, all right, we're going to finish this and we're going to make it work. And he did a spectacular job pulling everything together. Uh, so I was very pleased. Mike deserves the majority of the credit for it, along with Dustin Wright, uh, who was the person at Chaosium back in early 2000s who suggested the the, the game itself, suggested Pulp Cthulhu itself. So if you wanted to play the JSA or Batman the Shadow going after Cthulhu Cultus, this is the game for you? Yeah, if you, yeah, Doc Savage and the Shadow and the Spider and, and uh, uh, the kind of uh, the pulps of that uh, that group. The the pulps, if you actually go back and read the pulps, the pulps themselves were pretty apocalyptic. Um, and that's some of the stuff that I actually wrote for, for Pulp Cthulhu was framing this in the pulp tradition, where especially if you read the spider, uh, they're dropping buildings onto groups of nuns and children and melting people and giant play you know, operator five. There's a plague that wipes out half the United States. Uh, and that was kind of the regular week to uh, month to month for the pulps. Uh, these heroes were up against these these threats that were going to kill lots and lots of people. So actually, it worked pretty well for Cthulhu. If you if you have that in mind, it it transitions really well for Cthulhu again. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. Um, we should introduce the rest of our roundtable before I forget to. Um, Joining us from the UK is Aid Smith. How you doing, Aid? Hello, not too bad, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, joining us from the great state of Oklahoma is uh, Mr. Jacob Blackman. Hello, thank you for having me. And uh, we've got uh, Dr. Christopher McLaughlin. Professor, uh, actually. 
Professor, sorry, sorry. Uh, that's quite that's quite all right. I just I, I don't want to get caught lying about my credentials. I'm already in trouble claiming to be Gallifreyan on my application. So. <laughs> I was about to say that's a, that's a seventh thought to feed. Yeah, that's yeah. Crazy. So, um, Chris, we should say you're working for greater, greater than games, greater than games now these days, right? Uh, yes, and uh, also pursuing some other exciting opportunities that I'm hope that I'm hoping to uh, get more into in the coming year. But yes, my next big thing is for greater than. Okay, we should get those guys on uh, next couple of weeks because they released their quick start for the RPG uh, Gen Con this last time. So uh, we should try to do that the next couple of weeks. Um, also, is Walt Rebilliard joining us from uh, New England? How you doing, Walt? I'm not scary, but my dog is. <laughs> hey, sorry about, about that Patriots game, Walt. That sucks. You guys won't be uh, undefeated this year. Hey, how's that German Shepherd doing? Um, he's looking at me saying, uh, uh, "The Patriots better win next time, or I'm in trouble." So. <laughs> How do you feel about that, Chris? Well, you know, I've always said for years, every time the Patriots lose, an angel gets its wings. <laughs> See, I grew up in New England, so I'm with the Patriots here, man. You know? Right on, James. Well, you, you know, you know, if you make fun of a Patriots fan, at worst, they're just going to go cry on their five Super Bowl titles. So, you know. <laughs> well, they, they stunk for so long. Uh, if you were a fan of the Patriots back in the seventies, you know, they, they, <clears throat> winning now is is great, but you know you've suffered for it. It's mm. like being a Red Sox fan. You know, there, there was a long period where they yeah. were not good. But either way, you know, working in the beer industry like I do, um, either way I win because <laughs> if um, <laughs> you know, I mean, if if uh, the Patriots win, everybody gets excited; they get blasted. And sales are good. If the Patriots lose, they get upset. They get blasted. Sales are good. So either way, as long as they're playing, I'm good to go. That's it. <laughs> All right. So horror. In, uh, that's horror, kids. Horror. In uh, gaming and media. Uh, favorite movies or novels? Uh, Wade. Uh, where did I get Wade from? Aid. Go. Hi, what? <laughs> <laughs> hey, where's your hi, hi, hi? I was talking about fa favorite horror movie, TV show, novel, or game, and you can, uh, go, with, you can go with Doctor Who if you want. Oh, well, there's some th there's some very very good horror horror influenced Doctor Who episodes. Horror Fang Rock being a particularly good one. Um, but yeah, I I'm actually at the moment I'm watching American Horror Story. I've just started it last week, and I'm now in the second series, and it's actually much much better than I thought it was going to be. Freaky though, but, right? Yeah, I expect. I really did expect it to be like saw type horror stuff, where just basically people were just dying left, right, and center with no re rhyme or reason. And it actually had a fairly good plot. It was pretty interesting. So, um, see, now the second season, that's the haunted house one, right? Second season yeah. is the asylum. Oh, haunted house is the first one. S asylum, the second one. Third one, I think, is uh, the freak show. Is it the freak show one? The circus one. Anyway, Wait, the asylum one was weird, man. It, that got dark. Well, I guess it's it's called American Horror Story. It's going to get dark, but yeah, that, that just geez. That yeah. was... it's interesting. It's it's um it's got aliens in it. It's got uh, demons in it. It seems to have lots of weird stuff going on with with nuns. You know, what more can you want? <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> to be honest, the second season is my least favorite season of American Horror Story, and I love American Horror Story. As James a from James Cromwell, though, he makes it. He's very good. I was going to say, as a side note, uh, Jacob, if uh, somebody needs help with that uh, with that mission that I see in the reflection, uh, let me know. I can I can log yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, we're we're all very avid Guild Wars two players here. <laughs> well, hey, Jacob, while we're talking to you, uh, favorite horror game, novel, TV, movie. Oh, let's see here. I have quite a few because, you know, I, I really like the horror genre. Not so much slashers, but very much proper horror stuff. Uh, my most recent uh, watch horror film that I really like was The Void. Uh, really, really good, good horror movie there. Uh, for, uh, it's very much a mythos uh, movie. So to talk about to talk about its plot would be to kind of ruin it for you. Uh, I, but I do recommend it for people who love true, genuine horror movies. Uh, as a kid, I really liked, you know, the monster movies. So my, my favorite 
movie, which I, in fact, just rewatched last night, was The Monster Squad. Very cool. Uh, yeah. And you know, that had all those classic Hammer film elements to it that I really love. Um, you know, in terms of RPGs, I haven't played that much in the way of horror games. Uh, the the most long lasting horror game I played was a World of Darkness Innocence game, where you play children in a horror series. So you know, very much you know, getting that Monster Squad feel. It, it, it helped. It helped there. Um, and in terms of book series, I actually haven't read that many horror novels, so I'm just going to really have to say the classic Bram Stoker's Dracula. Oh, did you hear his uh, great-great-nephew is working on an official sequel, whatever that means in this context. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, you, you know, you, you can't live off Grandpa's uh, royalties forever, especially yeah, when he wants the book starts <laughs> getting ready to go into public domain, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Good point. Yeah. So, James, how about you? Um, a favorite horror movie, game, novel, etc. Um, I tend to like things that are uh, slipstream, right? things that are, are sort of cross genre. Uh, when, uh, in terms of uh, like horror novel, I like uh, Cornell Woolrich's Night Has a Thousand Eyes, uh, or uh, Michael Moorcock's Warhound in the World's Pain. Uh, things that are Warhound in the World's Pain is ostensibly a, a fantasy novel. Uh, Night Has a Thousand Eyes is ostensibly a hard-boiled detective story. Uh, but it's actually a horror novel uh, because the, the premise is this guy gets, uh, somebody predicts a guy's death, and his daughter and the detective are trying to discover if he's going to die at that time. Is it because fate is real, or is there just... Uh, a, a scheme going on. It's like Scooby-Doo, except they pull the mask off and there's something horrible underneath the mask. Um, and there are a lot of a lot of works that do that sort of slipstream stuff, especially in prose, are the ones that work the best for me for horror. Uh, I still like things like King in Yellow. Um, in more recent things, the, I just finished reading Victor Laval's uh, Ballad of Black Tom, which is a Cthulhu Mythos novella tour just published. Absolutely brilliant. Um, Kids Johnson's uh, Dream Quest of Velvet Bow. Again, it's a modern take on the mythos uh, from a very specific uh, writer's perspective. Here's what um, th this is how I'm engaging with this material based on on who I am as a writer, and it creates a really personal and really inventive kind of uh, take on the mythos. Okay. Uh, for, for films and stuff, I'm all over the place. I, uh, the Unknown, the the Lon Chaney Sr. Uh, circus film that Todd Browning directed before Freaks, um, all the way up to things like Audition uh, or, or uh, Haosu, uh, the Japanese film House, uh, Videodrome. Uh, I like a lot of, and, and for horror films, I like the films that address the fact that you are watching horror, uh, things like Videodrome, as I mentioned, uh, Peeping Tom, the British film Peeping Tom, uh, or uh, the uh, great Vincent Price movie, Witchfinder General, which is all about uh, characters dealing with violence and watching violence while you're watching a movie in which you're watching violence. So it's inviting you sort of to, to question your own participation in that. Um, Absolutely cheerful ending too. Uh, <laughs> just, just lovely. It's like worth it, worth it just for Vincent Price alone. I mean, just yeah. to hear him say any words is worth it. So. Oh, and he is so good in that movie. <laughs> yeah. He's just brilliant in that film. Price Price could certainly chew the scenery and and did a number of of scenery chewing films like uh, Theater of Blood or the Doctor Fives movies, which I love, and and those are really fun to watch. And it's kind of fun to watch Vincent Price bounce off the walls in those. Uh, but, but Witchfinder General, he's really good and really scary. Well, uh, Chris, how about you? 
Wow. Okay. Well, James has these wonderful, concise answers, and my brain, as usual, is all over the place. I because you know, to me, horror is almost something different in every every decade that you talk about it. Yeah. You know, I you know, looking at the '30s, I don't know if uh, I don't know if I'll ever have love anything more than Bride of Frankenstein. Because the older I get, the more I realize the scary part of that movie is that I think in our hearts we all believe we're the monster and we mean well, but the world will never know that. They will never see us as anything horrible or am I just insecure enough to read the movie that way? Don't answer that question. Um, the 1940s, uh, you know, uh, I, at the moment, I'm currently in love with Curse of the Cat People because, again, it's unconventional horror. That's great. Yeah, I mean, the, the horror in that film is what it's like to be an imaginative little girl in a time and a place where that's completely not appreciated. Yep. And it's very hard for me to watch that anymore and not think about all the amazing imaginative ladies that I'm blessed to work with in my life, in my teaching, in the game industry. And I can't help but wonder if I'm watching their childhood or at least bits of it. Yeah. 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 And yep. so, yeah. Um, and uh, gosh, from the silent era, I, Nosferatu, I, 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 that's a no sound will keep me up at night. Yep. <laughs> Still terrifies me. Uh, horror in the 1950s. Uh, I love Curse of Frankenstein more and more every time that I see that movie, just simply because of the physical portrayal that, that Sir Christopher gives as the monster. And Peter Cushing, I mean, my gosh, there's probably a film out there, Peter Cushing reading the phone book, and I will get the Blu-ray of that. Sure. Uh, the 60s, well, somebody stole my Witchfinder General speech there. Oh, there <laughs> Awesome. The, the other one I would have mentioned in the 50s and yes. 60s is Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt, which is another one that is kind of ostensibly a murder story. Girl goes home, her favorite yeah. uncle comes back to visit, and she finds out the world is a horrible, horrible place. Yeah. It's kind of David Lynch before David yeah. Lynch. Yeah, and, and you know, it's funny. It's so funny you mention that because in my little mental file, that's a film noir. Right. So, yeah, it's amazing. I, I never thought of it as a horror film before, but you're right. That's an extraordinary film that just leaps from genre to genre, like the best things always seem to do. Yep. So marvelous there. Okay, so, so, you, sp so you spoke up for uh, Witchfinder General. Hey, how about a shout-out to uh, Roger Corman's Post Cycle and The Devil Rides Out, the film that, mo that gave me and my wife our names. <laughs> uh, the 70s. Oh, my God. Uh, geez, 70s films. Uh, you know, I pre oh, uh, well, okay, the, I, there, I, the, my love for Vincent Price Camp comes through. Theater Blood is the first film I ever saw as a child because my parents were just kind of making it up as they go along. God bless them. But there I was, three years old, watching Vincent Price kill people and mm -hmm. thinking, this is this is the rest of my life I'm pretty much looking at. And you uh, there too, so it was education. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. I have to admit, I don't much get into a get into eighties horror very much. I, I, you know, you know, Reanimator is probably my favorite film from that decade, and even that's more of a horror comedy. Nineties uh, tends to leave me cold as well, but by the time you get to two thousand, you get I think you get into a really sublime era of horror, and it kind of starts for me with Shadow of the Vampire. And it goes all the way up to Get Out. I mean, if, if you're willing to do a little work, there are some fabulous original voices in the genre today. I mean, we've been blessed by things like It Follows, It Comes at Night, The Babadook. I mean, really, seriously, I don't know if there's a better, uh, except maybe the 70s. I don't know if there's been a better time to be alive and be a horror fan. There were a lot of, there were a lot of interesting things that were being done in horror in the 80s um, in Europe. Where you yeah. Went, where you ended up with uh, things like The Beyond and uh, the first two of, of the um, uh, Suspiria and Inferno, the first of the, the Three Mothers trilogy. Yes. Uh, and both of those are absolutely brilliant. Uh, uh, Inferno especially, for me, really, really works. Um, yeah, I have to admit, I'm not the world's biggest Argento fan, but I've always loved how his films, to a great degree, especially when he's in the zone, it's like watching a nightmare. Yes. Yes, and that's exactly what the European tradition for those movies does right. Uh, there's, a, there's a scene in Suspiria where a girl is running away from the killer, and she crawls through a transom into a room that's filled with razor wire. <laughs> Why is the room filled with razor wire? Doesn't matter. Welcome to my nightmare. <laughs> the thing I think doing. I've seen that one scene of the movie and yeah. nothing else. Yeah, and that's you know that this will st and that stuff sticks with you. Uh, there's a scene in Inferno 
uh, where it's about this building uh, that's that's got this weird uh, history to it, and a girl, a woman, is down investigating the basement and drops her keys into what immediately looks like a puddle, and then she ends up having to swim down into an entire flooded room <laughs> below the house where there are corpses floating around. <laughs> Trying to get her keys so she can get out, um, and and so the the and that's you get that with a lot of the Japanese films too, you know Getsu or or um, Kwai Don the the Hochi the earless sequence in Kwai Don yeah if, you, if you've never seen that is based on different traditions in horror so watching them as somebody who isn't necessarily steeped in that tradition makes them more alien and dreamlike. And is a real invitation then to go back and read uh, the, the the source material. I've read a bunch of of Japanese uh, uh, fairy tale material and and uh, uh, classical story material because of of films like uh, Quite On. No one mentioned these zombie movies. No one mentioned uh, Blair well, Witch. No. What the hell? Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, uh, Dawn of I, the Dead. I, 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 well, to, I, 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 I'm sorry, I tend to be a bit of a purist. To me, Night of the Living Dead and is science fiction because it's all caused by the radioactive satellite. <laughs> but yeah, I, but if you want to count that as a horror film, it's surely one of the best ever made. Yeah, Dawn of the Dead as well, the first, the original Dawn of the Dead. Though the remake is, is okay, too. Um, I, until, you get to the, until you get to that post credit sequence, and that's, that's yeah. where I first wanted to strangle Zack Snyder with my bare hands. Sure, yep, yep. Okay, uh, so the, that's the, 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 it's okay. Patricia Tolman one, the 90s one. Yeah. Talk about, yeah. That's oh, the night, so remake, the, night the, remake. Night, the night of the Living Dead remake is with, with uh, which the, the, the thing that was so clever about that was changing the narrative about race in the first movie into a narrative about um, mm. sexism and misogyny, um, which works. And that's the, the best part about zombie films is zombies are kind of a blank slate. You can lay any message over the top of those stories you want. And if you're going to tell an intelligent story that will draw people in and, and be worth watching over many years, like Dawn of the Dead, it's about consumerism. The whole thing being set in the mall and why do they come here? They knew it was important to them in life. Uh, that's that's a, a level to that film that works because the zombie is a blank slate. You can See, do I, 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 I like Day of the Dead out of the earlier ones yep that's my favorite you know I, um, I, I, I not to ruin it for you but just just to make mention of this if you ever get an opportunity somebody has posted george romero's original script for day of the dead back when he had 10 times the funding yeah, yeah. and I, I i just want I, I set out to glance at it wound up reading an enti the entire thing in one sitting and i had a little tear in the eye at the end <laughs> it, 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 it's it's honestly the greatest zombie film that will never get made sure. if you appreciate day of the dead looking at what might have been i think i think i think i would recommend hey walt uh, how about you um i started uh young uh on reading horror especially in novels uh, mm -hmm. Somebody turned me on to H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people on the on the podcast know that uh, English is actually my second language, so somebody recommended H.P. Uh, Lovecraft as a way to uh, engross myself in some of the um, the fringes of English. So, um, simulations and non Euclidean geometry, right? <laughs> so, yeah, the, the easy stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had a, a good, on that spelling test, then, right? <laughs> uh, I had a good grasp of things, uh, you know, um, and the main portions of the language, but you know, I, I really wanted to, uh, to live up to my grandfather's expectation that if you wanted to be treated well in life, you had to speak well. So, um, that was one of the things, and and H.P. Uh, Lovecraft really uh, touched my love of both sci-fi and horror. But later, um, as I got older, um, one of the things I love is any type of horror fiction that truly displays how the human animal behaves under stress. So um, uh, uh, favorite book, horror book of all time has to be Needful Things, just because of the fact that uh, uh, Stephen King writes a great person story. Yep. And um, uh, investigating how people react over things they need versus things they want. And um, uh, stuff like that. Any, 
any any situation um, where the protagonist has to be reduced to um, base impulses and you see what that person is really like versus what they portray in normal society. So um, things like Dean Koontz's intensity, um, uh, even, even uh, you know, uh, like, um, oh, what was the one with uh, the writer that gets uh, run off the road? And, misery. Uh, misery. Misery. You know, I mean, yes, the the film, the film that will have you wake up, waking up middle the middle of the night screaming because you've had a nightmare that somebody. I don't like what you did with that guy, stat block. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Very very true. If, right. If you uh, if you like those kind of books and you haven't seen it before, there's a Jonathan Carroll novel, one of my favorites, called The Land of Laughs. Oh yeah, and I've actually it, read that. Yeah, and it's about a writer who ends up in a town that kind of is like the one he created. It. it the uh, John Carpenter movie Mouth of Madness is is sort of the uh, the same story with the with the serial numbers filed off. The Carol novel <laughs> is brilliant, uh, but yeah, Land of Laughs. If you get a chance to to uh, to dig that up, I think based on the the books you mentioned, you dig that one. I'm writing it down right now, but yeah, uh, you know, to go according to uh, what we have in the background um, uh, on the screen with James, um, first horror game. Call of Cthulhu, loved yeah. it. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. You know, I love the fact that we went from Dungeons and Dragons and uh, Marvel superheroes uh, back at that time, and then all of a sudden we no longer had powers, no longer had fantastic magic to call on. Well, unless you were absolutely crazy, right. um, uh, and you you had to figure stuff out um, and 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 get away from the horror. You know, and I think games like that and, and genres like this um, show that, uh, you know, we can reduce everybody to basically one line. Uh, and it's that meme from a zombie movie where I don't have to be the fastest. I just have to be faster than you, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, yeah, there's, there's great genre. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Yeah. So we, we used to alternate between second edition or first edition, probably the AD&D and Call of Cthulhu. And Cthulhu, who has always been the game that I love the most, but never get to play, because I can never find a group at the moment that actually wants to play it. So it's really difficult to actually do it. Because oh, we're all going to die at the end. What's the point? So that is the point. It's the story you tell. It's the how story. you get there. It's, it's yeah, whether exactly. you have a good death or not. They, they can't get around that. They, they, a lot of them seem to just want to therefore and make sure they get their characters to improve. And hey, like 120 hit points rather than 115. Right. Yep. It's like no. We want to see, tell the story, tell the story, and you'll really enjoy it. But yeah, the the um, the uh, early stuff for like, um, oh god, st is it Stars of Right, Sport of Azathoth, and yep. all those campaigns? Love those, absolutely fantastic stuff with those, brilliant. Well, that's. So, yeah, you, oh, with, I'm sorry, go ahead. With with horror gaming, I mean, you already you just hit on one of the main things is it's not the same type of experience that you get with D and D, where you're building up and and. The point of it is to have this character that will go week to week, and you're you're building a story over a long period of time. With a with a horror game, really, you're talking about much shorter narratives and stories that can be told in one night or two nights uh, as you're playing, which makes it a very different gaming experience. And Cthulhu, as a game, does that the best because it is baked right into the system. The more you know, the worse you will be. Mm. <laughs> the more that you discover the more you're going to pay for it and the closer you are to dying and, and, or going insane and then dying. Um, and, and that's, I think the, the strongest part about it, but it does take people. It does take players who are interested in playing that kind of game. And, you know, years later, uh, after playing that game, uh, I had already, uh, I had already gone my twenties and, and, uh, I was into my thirties and, they came out with that movie Event Horizon, and I was like, "Oh my God, it's Cthulhu in space! Let's do this!" Right? You know, so good, definitely good stuff. It, something that can cross genre, cross time periods, as you know, many publishers have, have displayed. Um, I think it's I think it's a great setting. The interesting yep. thing about it as well is is nowadays we've we're getting a lot more of those storyteller games like Fate and all this kind of stuff where there isn't a lot of character there is character development, but there's not leveling. And Cthulhu fits right in with that. Yep. So I think Cthulhu should be I'm trying that's what I'm trying to sell to the people I play with. It's like, yeah, it's like it's it's a story game. It's not a 
leveling game. Don't worry about the leveling, worry about telling the story. So hopefully, yeah, we'll get a bit to persuade them. But um, yeah, I think it fits in right there. This is a good point to mention. Um, I'm going to tag on to the back end of this podcast. Uh, Walt and I interviewed Orion Canning uh, last week. He recently wrote a story game called um, Abnormal Things, uh, which is, you know, does, it's a storytelling game designed to tell stories um, similar to the Stranger Things uh, that show by the Duffer Brothers on Netflix. There you go. And based on Abnormal by Avery Adler. So uh, something to check out. Hang on, hang out, run out for this podcast for uh, the interview with Orion. It's definitely worth your time. Um, James, you might be the best person I can think of to ask this question. Do uh, you have any good GM tips for running an effective horror session? Uh, I think it's sort of the same things you'd use for um, storytelling for a horror film, maybe less with a novel. <clears throat> uh, you, you need to be careful about your control of information, what you're telling the players as they move through things. They will always imagine worse things that you than what you will come up with to uh, to do them in. So if you throw out information and pace the game in a way that allows the players to imagine the worst and gives them time to imagine the worst, uh, they will participate in the horror storytelling with you. Uh, and that means sometimes throwing out things, noises that don't necessarily mean anything, and sometimes you throw out noises that means the thing is right behind them. <laughs> and and if you if you as the GM you you vary those, uh, you keep the the players sort of out of their comfort zone. They don't know when the next thing is going to happen, um, and that's that's an important part. Um, the um, the rest of it, though, is is you know just that idea that that you need to control information and and uh, be careful about how you pace things out and and uh, give them the opportunity to win some fights, but know that all fights are going to have a cost. Uh, those 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 things are the ones that I think just as a GM I use in putting together horror games. Okay, Chris, how about you? Well, I have to give a tremendous vote of respect to um, a uh, old, old friend of mine, the Reverend Todd Kingria, who was our resident Call of Cthulhu GM. And everything I knew about, I know about running horror games and really a good chunk of what I know about game mastering, I know from just watching him work. And uh, James talking about the importance of the imagination reminds me a lot of the miracles that he was able to work in his kitchen at Rad near out in Radford, Virginia, because... He, while he had definite plots in mind, he was always very, 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 very careful about 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 getting information out of there, letting people imagine their own horrors, as James said. But I always loved how he did a great job of setting the atmosphere. I mean, we his players immediately forgot that they were just sitting in his kitchen, you know, and like, you know, the scariest thing near them was, you know, maybe the microwave might land on them. And he always had this oil lamp for his games. He always ran his games and like is near total darkness as you could get away with and still um, see your dice. Hmm. And it's just amazing how much creepier everything is when it's near dark. And honestly, I especially I think the, the more we get into this modern 24-hour age of ours, I think we become all the more terrible of an absence of light. And, and, and honestly, I... I it, I don't think I ever really got comfortable with the dark till I started Civil War reenacting, and I had no choice but to hang out by the campfire. And even then, I had a gun with me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you know, I mean, it's a it's a it's a game where I think atmosphere really, really, really does pay off. Yeah, and and when you're when you're doing individual scenes, um, uh, going through and making sure you've got written out a description that conveys the information you want yes. is very important when you're doing it. It's really hard to do that off the cuff. So actually do the paragraph description of what the room looks like or what the creepy old house looks like or what you know the, the headless body you just found looks like. Uh, and that's, that goes under the, the control of information too, but it's also, as, as Chris just said, setting the atmosphere, setting the scene. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, uh, you know, it's, if sometimes in, you know, you, you, if you're an artist, you get lucky and you tap into something that scares the whole world, like George Romero and zombies. Right. But for most of us, we're not that brilliant and/or lucky. And you know, I mean, the only way you can truly get horror across to your audience is to let their own imaginations go to work on them. Yep. Um, 
Any, anybody else have any experience uh, running horror games? It sounded like you did some Call of Cthulhu back in the day. Well, yeah, uh, um, you know, well, back in the day that that we're talking many many moons ago, you know, <laughs> kids, you're you're only you know you're only exposed to so much. And it, what I've noticed about running horror games, um, we just finished up uh, a game of uh, Savage Worlds Rippers, um, and. Uh, uh, the one thing you notice is that um, the the aspect of the horror in the game becomes increasingly um, more subtle uh, and and touches on uh, your like like you guys were saying touches on your players' fears more than what you fear because in the beginning when you're running these kind of games when you're young you know you really don't know a lot about other people's fears or the fears of people at your table other than you know your buddy once mentioned oh i hate clowns you know, so, I mean, <laughs> so that's you know, not really you, helpful you know if you think about it <laughs> so i mean you you really you really base things off of your fear when you're running your games when you're younger but then as you understand more about human nature and you understand more about people um as you as you get older those games become more complex and the horrors become subtle because instead of touching on your fears you're now trying to tap into and activate those fears of your players at the table so um but th now that we're in, in uh such a modern age where you know um these james bond devices that we have floating around everywhere you can do some really creepy tricks like um um, they were um, they were investigating uh, a series of murders in in our game recently, and uh, uh, you know I, I texted to uh, somebody in the other room. I'm like, do me a favor when I when you see the text message that says go, pick up a phone book, drop it flat in the floor, <laughs> you know. And this this murderer had been going around and. Um, uh, later on, they found it had a supernatural aspect, but they found out it was this person had been going around and 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 shooting people, uh, you know, uh, from rooftops like a sniper. Um, and you know, they're sitting there and they they know they got him trapped in this one room because they knew it. They had him pinned, and all their powers and their and their notice checks had, had had led them to that point. And all of a sudden, the phone book drops. Everybody like lunges from the table because you know they're they're, they're going after this guy, and the sound of that phone book just put everybody into overdrive. And then they look, oh, and you know, I, I describe that the NPC that had been leading them through that part of the city as their kind of guide um, just turns and, you know, he's, he, he's like mouthing, like he's trying to breathe and he pulls down his little ascot and he's got a large, large caliber hole in his neck, you know, so now they're all diving and, and dice are rolling. And it, it, it really, it, you know, the fact that I had a cell phone that I could text message somebody and be like, at dramatically appropriate time, please drop phone book. Thank you. Right. You know, that stuff is, is, is amazing for stuff like that. Or even um, uh, during a convention, um, I had planted uh, um, these mini walkie talkies <laughs> around the room. <laughs> you know, and and like random noises were coming out of places in the room, and it's just, you know, uh, a lot of fun stuff can be had if you if you look at uh, some everyday common things and just play around with them. You can create atmosphere. That, that's, that's, so, and that's, that's so cool. cool. Yeah, I, that, that's yeah. good GMing. Period. It doesn't matter. You know, that it, it works especially well for horror. But yeah, I mean, you're crossing crossing the line for some of that stuff into LARPing, uh, essentially. Yeah. Uh, with that, which is great. Yeah, I, it, was, know, it, was, it was definitely fun. You know, yeah, even with the walkie talkies, they were looking yeah. for a security guard at one point and uh, they keep saying, Hey, you know, please respond, please respond. And then at one point, you know, um, I turned the walkie talkie on, <laughs> on my side and they heard it all the way in the other room and they're like, Whoa, what the hell is that? <laughs> Cause it was just yeah. us in the house. So now they go up to, you know, one of the guys goes up to investigate, comes back with the walkie talkie and, mm. you know, I hand him a note that says, you know, you found the dead body and here's the description. So, I mean, it, it, stuff like that can be a lot of fun, you know, just play, play with your environment a little. You know, with my luck, if I tried that, I'd start getting stuff from the local air force base, like spider. <laughs> <laughs> Massachusetts, you'd call in the bog sprayer and, you know, then your house is just covered in, Mosquito fog and <laughs> oh jeez, oh. oh. How about it, Mike? What have you done? Any horror gaming? I can't say that I have actually. Um, 
I um, ran a lot of Werewolf back in the 90s, but I hesitate to call what I was running a horror game or a personal horror game, however Werewolf wanted to build itself, because um, it all kind of wound up being, you know, the regular Werewolf modern day stuff sort of wound up being, you know, furry X-Files. But well, I want to say furry, like furry. I want to say like, <laughs> hairy people t- doing X-Files or, you know, hairy people as vigilantes and superheroes. I did a Wild West campaign for a long time, which kind of wound up being, you know, if, if you were mashing up werewolves and uh, Clint Eastwood in the, you know, 60s or 70s. Yeah. Well, you know, Mike, 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 Mike has brought up an interesting point, I think, for those of us that work in the tabletop industry is, is isn't it funny how Vampire and all of its offshoots kind of, kind of flipped the table as far as like even a horror themed game was because i remember when i when somebody first showed me vamp tried to turn me on to vampire my my rather glib response was hey everything i learned about everything i need to know about vampires i learned from carl kolchak right. you know i could never quite wrap my head around oh wait now we're the monsters but that, man. That, yeah that changes the dynamic <clears throat> it changes the dynamic Th- though you can still do um, really good World of Darkness stuff where you're introducing the characters into the world where they don't know what's going on. Um, uh, Josh Deutsch did a brilliant, brilliant World of Darkness novel uh, toward the end of White Wolf, uh, right before they were bought out by CCP, uh, called uh, Strangeness in the Proportion. It's available, I think, still as a POD and as, as an ebook. Uh, fantastic thing about a guy who just thinks he he's kind of an odd guy. He works in a mortuary and uh, 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 medical examiner, and he likes silent films, and he's kind of a fan of that kind of comedy and pratfalls and stage magic, and he realizes over the course of this book that the world is the world of darkness, the entire you know span of, of the white world no you. And it's, it's a fantastic horror novel, fantastic horror novel. Yeah, I, I just thought, like I said, I never found a way to, to do it quite right, and I always gravitate towards uh, uh, other genres. But um, I gotta say, I don't think I was alone because honestly, most World of Darkness games I knew of sort of wound up being supernatural superheroes at, at some point. Sure, so. that that is an issue I personally had with the World of Darkness is the the characters really didn't feel like monsters, uh, as my roommates are often fond of saying. It's more like you are superheroes with a daylight allergy. <laughs> Uh, I have never played it myself, but uh, they are they have fond memories of playing a game called Chill. Oh sure. And there oh, was yeah. the cre- there was a, a a source book for that called the Creature Feature. Yep. Allowed you to play monsters, and in that you played monsters. You weren't you weren't this oh woe is me vampire. You were a I am the night. I am darkness. I am evil vampire. Yeah. And you could you could do things like you know find find a person who you wanted to kill and just slaughter them and you know that that'd be fine, but if you did creepy things like ate their family one at a time, uh, you know nailed their nailed their favorite pet onto their door uh, uh, onto their doorstop and and stalked them for a couple of weeks before you finally killed them then you got all this power that came to you because you were being a monster jesus christ okay yeah well i mean and that's that's something that the new white wolf is facing right now with you know with the idea that how how much fun is that to play i mean yeah you know where where is the line on this is a game and it's and it is you know there's a moral component to it there's a social component to it and playing the monster and being the monster comes with a whole different set yeah. of of uh, values well, I, you know, I, I, there's something about a game that you pick it up and you kind of feel like you've picked up your copy of violence by mistake yes yes <laughs> right um and and but the, the the challenge then if you play world of darkness where the characters are tragic and they're misunderstood then you know are they just superhero characters because at, at heart they're positive um world of darkness i always found mage to be the most interesting part of the setting because those were characters that were trying to make sense of the world like the larger part of the world mm. um and they could be gray but it was never the same sort of, of 
uh, the same sort of, of black and white that you got with the with the rest of the game. So I, yeah. I, sorry, go on. No, please go ahead. I was gonna say I played I played Vampire for years. I played Werewolf for years. I played Mage for a fairly short amount of time, and then uh, onto Changeling for a little bit as well. So I'm a really big um, World of Darkness fan. But you are right in saying that yeah, the the, the, the Werewolf stuff did tend out to be more of a power gaming thing rather than a horror thing. I love the monsters in Werewolf. The, we the werewolf monsters and the idea of Pentex being this hidden horror that it yeah. is always there is fantastic. And I love the setting for that. But I think the best game we ever came, we ever did in World of Darkness was them effectively playing a Scooby-Doo like group of regular <laughs> humans that yeah. were investigating this weird stuff going on because it was now it was now a World of Darkness Call of Cthulhu game. Right. And it was much more interesting there because you were actually scared of stuff. When you saw a werewolf, you ran away from the werewolf. You didn't go and <laughs> smash it down with whatever you've got going on. So, yeah, yeah that, 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 love, the, love the scene. Yeah, yeah. and that's, the, that's the, the, like I mentioned, that Josh Deutsch, Joshua Deutsch novel. Um, that's really what it is. And, and it's this character who has these sort of weird powers, and he's a weird character, and he's trying to find out what his place is in the world of darkness. And mm. which side does he belong in? Does he belong in the shadow? Does he belong in the light? You know, the, the working assumption all of the normal characters have at the beginning of a story is that, well, we're, we're the good guys. Well, of course we're the good guys we, <laughs> because we're us. And <laughs> there's some really interesting gaming where the characters discover that they're not the heroes or that the world is much more complicated than, than it seems. And that's, that is one of the core elements of horror just as horror is you have characters who have assumptions about the world, and by the end of the story, they realize the world is not what they thought it was. Hey, I just wanted to make sure, uh, we, we brought up Pulp Cthulhu, right? The book you, you won the Emmy for? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, any supplements coming out in support of that? Adventures or? Uh, yeah, there's, um, uh, there's uh, an adventure book out, Two-Headed Serpents. Um, there's probably going to be more uh, things for it. Uh, we were the company's been very happy with the response to it. It's a fantastic book, and and you know one of the things I mentioned early on was that you know that book started in 2000 and whatever, and went over all of these different incarnations. And, and the thing that I I really marvel at Mike Mason being able to do is go back and pull a lot of the material from the earlier incarnations of the of the game the book. And we found ways to include them seamlessly into the new material. Mm. So Wolfgang Bauer had written an adventure for the very first version of it, um, mm. set in Shanghai, and that that in a in a version of that made it in. Jeff Tidball had done some stuff on uh, on the setting in the 1930s that made it into the final. Uh, the material I did on the pulps made it into the final. Uh, you know, Mike Mason, and that's all in the service of. Uh, a really great rule system that tweaks the Call of Cthulhu basic rules just enough that it is uh, that it is heroic, but it's not so overpowered that it's a superheroes game. Um, it's it's a it's a great design. They did a fine job with it. Mike did a fantastic job with the rules. Yeah, when you mentioned you could win from week to week, I was like, wow, that makes it a wildly optimistic uh, version of Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> you get right, and, but but that's I mean the idea is that. It, this was the thing from the original pulps that Operator Five, you know, was fighting the war against the Purple Empire month to month, and he would win at the get, at the end of the given month. But nobody was ignoring the fact that oh, the Purple Empire did gas half the United States and killed everybody. <laughs> That's still you know, there's the ruin behind you, uh, but you've managed to save the other half of the United States for this month. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> uh, and, and that's that's where it's actually, I think, the idea of doing a pulp-style Cthulhu game is actually fitting for the pulp. Uh, if you actually go back and read the originals, it's fitting for the pulp era. Another good uh, thing for pulp would be uh, Lobs Johnson books. Yeah. That, oh, would, yeah. that would be perfect. I can see yeah. that. That, that worked really well, yeah. Yep, yep. The Mike Mignola stuff definitely taps back into that, uh, the, the whole Hellboy uh, uh, setting that whole era um, material they do too uh, ta uh, taps into that tradition. 
Yeah, maybe. I guess Magnolia would be a good sense for a lot of stuff related to Call of Cthulhu because there's uh, those kind of yeah. themes come up uh, over and over. Uh, can we ever have too much Cthulhu in pop culture and gaming, especially? Yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes, it is, it is entirely possible to have too much Cthulhu. Have, have, have we reached that point? Are we at Cthulhu uh, saturation? Death well, there's, five? there's Cthulhu Yahtzee, uh, <laughs> and, it's, and it's shaped like Cthulhu. Um, it's kind of crazy when you think about I mean, for me, I was introduced to the Lovecraft material through the Call of Cthulhu role playing game in the late 70s. Uh, one of my uh, the the family, three brothers I, I role played with, um, we played D&D, we played Villains and Vigilantes, uh, and we were going to try uh, Call of Cthulhu. The older of uh, the brother had all the Arkham editions, and so he knew the Lovecraft material. But beyond getting it in that and some of like the Ballantine Adult Fantasy stuff, nobody else was doing anything with that material. There were occasionally bad horror adaptations like uh, the Dunwich Horror and uh, <laughs> uh, movies, movies like that. Occasionally, you know, the episode of Night Gallery uh, that did cool air with the horrible, horrible flamenco guitar through the whole thing. Um, I still, I still think, I, I still think that's an incredible adaptation. It that, is a great adaptation. The music kills you. Though. I, I never notice it. I it, never notice it. I, you, I, get, I get so wrapped up in Barbara Rush's performance. Yes, it's a it's a great adaptation. But those those were that's a, a, how obscure that material was. Now it's everywhere. Now mm -hmm. everybody sort of understands. You know, there's a Library of America edition of Lovecraft stories. It's made it into the mainstream. So has anyone else read Alan Moore's Providence? Yes. See, that's, this is exactly what it's about. Alan Moore's Providence effectively is Cthulhu who really exists and he there's a, co a competition between his reality and our reality and he's slowly been sneak uh, sneaking in Cthulhu references to take over our reality and bring his back. Right. So you see Cthulhu toys and Cthulhu games and Cthulhu, because Cthulhu is really out there and he wants people to worship Cthulhu so that Cthulhu takes over. Right. And it's brilliant. Love it. Yep. Preferences one of my favorite books last year. Absolutely yeah. spectacular. Oh, it's a great comic. And and you know, that's one of the things in the argument for public domain, where mm, things yes. go into the public domain because you you really want creators to be able to uh, comment on the things in the popular culture around them. So I, you know, I'd mentioned the Victor Laval book and and uh, Ballad of Black Tom and Kids Johnson's Dreamcast Developed Bow. That's what those are. Those are those creators doing brilliant responses to that material, which they wouldn't be able to do if that material would, were not in the public domain. Hmm. There reminds me of someone suing to get but the bright for, rights for Buck Rogers, and so. Oh, good oh, God. Don't bring yeah. up Buck Rogers. <laughs> uh, I work for TSR, man. Um, um, you know all about that, huh? <laughs> oh, I, I, love, I, I still love that game. I, I love that game. The, the, the Rogers game from TSR was pretty fun. The, well, the role-playing game was amazing. One of the, my, first, my first Gen Con was demoing the Buck Rogers board game at the castle uh, back when TSR had the castle. The, actually, the first bit of published fiction I did for TSR, and not a lot of people know this, is I ghosted one of the stories in the Arrival Anthology. Ooh. Uh, I wrote it over a weekend, and then then the editor rewrote what I had written because uh, a bunch of the authors had bailed out because they could not bear working on the material anymore. Oh, really? God. And so oh, yeah, I, got, that... I got to write a story over the weekend, and uh, it's it's under the name Uriki O'Reilly. Um, <laughs> that's not a fake name. Um, <laughs> So I, I eBayed uh, all of the original Buck Rogers stuff and the uh, the novels, and I'm getting the um, Mega Drive retro console. And the first thing I'm buying for it is the Buck Rogers game. There you <laughs> so go. I can play it again. Yep. Yeah, there, there are there is a lot of in, uh, there's a lot of that material, and I think uh, Jeff Grubb and Mike Pondsmith, the material that they created for it is fantastic. The 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 gaming stuff, the role playing stuff that they created for it. It, it is great, and it's too bad that it didn't get the attention it should have gotten because people were reacting to it, to it being bought. And um, the board game, the twenty, the Buck Rogers board game, the big honking mm -hmm. the universe game was really fun. Actually, it, it's a good board game. Yeah, just uh, I, 
when you if you're not looking at the gaming products or the comics, I think Dynamite had a few years ago. It's you think Buck Rogers and you think well the 1930s or you know the uh, the Gil Gerard series from the 80s and yeah, like, you, think, you think Tweaky. Uh, <laughs> oh, totally, yeah. <laughs> And so you wonder well, why is someone? I mean, because lawsuits aren't cheap. They're spending a lot of money to contest. You know who has the rights to this stuff. So. Right, and it's the it's the heirs of um, the uh, Philip Nolan who had written the original Buck Rogers uh, uh, prose fiction in Amazing Stories, and the heirs to the Dilly family uh, to the Dilly family. Uh, John Dilly was the newspaper syndicate guy who put together. Uh, uh, the uh, idea of Buck Rogers from that thing in Amazing Stories with a comic strip artist and then popularized the comic strip. Mm. But he didn't he didn't create Buck Rogers. The, the, the Dilly family tends to lean heavily towards saying that John Dilly created Buck Rogers. I don't think that's entirely true. Uh, it all depends on how you want to define create, I guess. But that's what the fight is, is, is it's between the people who are the heirs of the guy who wrote the Amazing Stories uh, novella and then uh, the, the newspaper syndicate's heirs. So it's like, it's, again, we're in, we're in a similar Alan Moore territory. It's like, hey, you didn't create Watchmen. You just adapted some DC stuff to be the Watchmen. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, wow, okay, um, that was a long, interesting uh, tangent there, uh, yes. James. <laughs> I'm sorry, you, you mentioned Buck Rogers, I get these flashbacks. <laughs> so, it's, it's ugly. You used to work at TSR, I, I should probably know better than to bring that up. Um, probably a sore spot. But, uh, all right, well, hey, um, I think we should go ahead and wrap things up. We're coming up on the hour mark. Anybody have any last-minute thoughts, things they want to get out there? Uh, yeah, I wanted to thank everybody that has uh, picked up our uh, Hurricane Harvey uh, charity uh, fundraiser bundle and oh. uh, that Mike put together. And by the way, God bless you, Mike, for putting that together. And A, thank you in particular for, for, for making my words look good in like three hours, I think, <laughs> they gave you to do that. It took, it took me a couple of days. It took me two, it, I did it about eight hours, I think. <laughs> well, as it, long it, as you were happy with it, that's all that matters, because I was oh, about, getting a bit I'm, panicky. <laughs> really, really, I just, I felt, I felt like such a jerk. Hey, Mike, I know it's the last minute, and I've just been grateful for everything that's happened from there, and I'm really proud to be even a tiny part of what you guys are doing, and really just taking that negative and turning it into a huge positive. I really, really thank you guys. And thank you well, guys for everybody that's bought that. We should probably mention to our listeners that they can still get um, the Hurricane Harvey uh, charity bundle on RPG Now or Drive Through RPG. Uh, it's a $25 donation for over $400 of gaming PDFs. A uh, ton of stuff. Lots of OSR, I means Masterminds, Fate, Savage War, all kinds of stuff on there, all kinds of genres. It's for a great cause because I don't know if you've watched the news lately, Things are a little messed up in Texas right now. And there's yeah. a way you can help out and get some great gaming products at the same time. It's running through midday on Tuesday. And Tuesday, in this case, being the 12th of September, 2017. So um, please check it out while you can. Uh, the generosity of the community has been really great to see. We're over, uh, boy, well, well, remember the last update I gave you? Was it 17? 17 and change, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's that's. that's great. Yeah, that's not even a full week. So, yeah, please give that a look. We'd appreciate it. Uh, the BAMP podcast has a Patreon. Uh, you know, like PBS, feel free to check us out and, you know, drop us a buck or two. And uh, we'll wish we could send you a coffee mug, but we can't. <laughs> tote bag. Tote bag. <laughs> so, someday we'll get tote bags. Uh, we should get just shot glasses or uh, I don't know something. No, just make sure uh, if you're going to monogram anything. Thong underwear. <laughs> What's wrong with you, Walt? What's wrong with you? Hey, he's you know, got the right priorities. I, I'm keeping with the horror theme. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, there you are. And it all ties back together to horror. Horror, kids. Horror. There's two syllables there. So, uh, thanks everybody for coming out today. It's been great uh, talking with you all. And listeners, we'll catch you next time on the Banff Podcast. <laughs>